So next we'll talk about the potassium sparing diuretics. So these diuretics act in the collecting tubule to prevent sodium reabsorption and also potassium excretion. Okay. So it stops um, sodium reabsorption and also the uh, excretion of potassium so that potassium will be spared. Okay. It's mainly used in the treatment of hypertension and that's usually concurrently used together with the thiazide and also it's used in heart failure. Okay, So in heart failure, it's mainly the aldosterone antagonist rather than the sodium channel blocker. So potassium levels are to be closely monitored in patients who are taking potassium sparing diuretics, obviously. And this group of drugs needs to be avoided okay, in patients with renal dysfunction because of the increased risk of hyperkalemia. So there are two um, classes of subclasses of drugs in this group. The number one is aldosterone antagonist and the second one is the sodium channel blockers. So the aldosterone antagonists are mainly spironolactone and apelrenone. Okay, apelrenone and spironolactone. So the mechanism of action for spironolactone is it's a synthetic steroid that blocks aldosterone at the intracytoplasmic, okay, intracellular cytoplasmic receptor sites. And this causes the spironolactone receptor complex to be inactive. And this will prevent translocation of the receptor complex into the nucleus of the target cell. And thereby, and because of that, um, they will be unable to yield mediated proteins that stimulate the sodium potassium exchange sites of the collecting tubule. And this will prevent the sodium reabsorption, enhance potassium and also hydrogen secretion. Next, we have apelrenon, which is another aldosterone receptor antagonist. Okay, it blocks the aldosterone receptor like spironolactone. And the actions are also similar to spironolactone but may have less endocrine effects. Actions mainly in edema, um, blood levels of aldosterone are usually high, and this leads to retention of sodium. So spironolactone will block this aldosterone activity causing retention of potassium and excretion of sodium. Okay. And the effects may be diminished okay, by giving NSAIDs. So this is similar to the same as thiazides and loop diuretics. Okay. They always have um, diminished effects when you have NSAIDs because of the reduction in the renal blood flow mainly. Okay, the therapeutic uses Number one, it's a diuretic, obviously. So, although the aldosterone blockers are less effective in moving sodium from the body compared with the other diuretics, they have the advantage, okay? They have the benefit of causing the retention of potassium, okay, compared to the other um, diuretics. So, these drugs are usually given together with thiazide or loop diuretics to prevent potassium excretion that would usually happen with these drugs. And then, um, okay, as a diuretic, it's also used as a second in secondary hyperaldosteronism. Okay, secondary hyperaldosteronism. So, for example, in hepatic cirrhosis, and then in nephrotic syndrome. So it's useful to use aldosterone antagonist. Okay, so that you can retain the sodium and also you uh, remove, I'm sorry, you can retain potassium and remove your sodium. Okay. So, um, 
On the other hand, patients with insignificant circulating levels of aldosterone, then there is no diuretic effect with the use of this drug. Okay, so if you have like Edison disease, um, which is the primary adrenal insufficiency, so um, given giving this drug will not um, cause a diuretic effect. Okay. Third um, indication for using this drug is heart failure. Okay, so aldosterone antagonists will inhibit remodeling of the heart that follows as a compensation for heart failure. Okay, and they can decrease mortality. Okay, mortality associated with heart failure, especially when in those patients with reduced ejection fraction. Okay, so in patients with reduced ejection fraction in heart failure, so aldosterone antagonist are uh, associated with a decreased mortality. And then um, the fourth indication is resistant hypertension. Okay, so usually these patients, this cohort of patients tend to respond well to aldosterone blockers. Okay, whether they are those with um, normal or with um, increased aldosterone levels. So the next um, indication is ascites, okay. So ascites, so spironolactone is effective for ascites. The next indication, the sixth one is polycystic ovarian syndrome. So spironolactone is used off-label. This is meaning that it's not the main use that is enlisted in um, from the drug company, okay. So it's a use that um, doctors have discovered and they they find it to be um, useful even though it's not official, okay? It's not officially endorsed by the drug company. And then spironolactone blocks androgen receptors and hinders or prevents steroid synthesis at increased doses. So this will help to counter the effect of increased androgen levels seen in this order. In this disorder. Pharmacokinetics um, both spironolactone and epirenone are absorbed after oral administration. Uh, they are significantly bound to plasma proteins. Spironolactone are extensively metabolized and then converted to several active metabolites. And this drug is an potent inhibitor of P glycoprotein. So, epirenone is metabolized by the cytochrome P450, 3A4, CYP 3A4. So, what are the adverse effects of um, this aldosterone antagonist? So, mainly um, for spironolactone is gastric upset. Okay, It may induce gynecomastia, okay? gynecomastia in males. And also menstrual irregularities in females hyperkalemia so that's why we have to use um, potassium sparing diuretics um, cautiously um, when used with other treatment that can cause hyperkalemia okay when you use um, potassium sparing diuretics with drugs that can induce hyperkalemia such as ACE inhibitors um, captopril and elaprid all that and potassium supplements and then it can also cause nausea, lethargy, mental confusion. And however, at low doses, it can be used chronically with few side effects. Okay, so at low doses, it's not an issue. It's mainly at the higher doses, um, spironolactone will cause issues. And then we have the trimeterine and amyloride, so the sodium blockers. Okay, so we can, if we had to recap, so we have, um, so there are the potassium sparing diuretics. So they have two different mechanisms of action. One is the aldosterone antagonist and the next is the sodium channel blockers. Okay, so now we are going to touch upon the, um, the topic, the subtopic of sodium channel blockers. So we have trinterine and amyloride. So both of these, these drugs um, block, um, they block sodium transport channels causing a decrease in sodium potassium exchange. 
um, although they have a potassium sparing diuretic action, which is comparable to that of the aldosterone antagonist, their ability to block the sodium potassium exchange site in the collecting tubule is not aldosterone dependent. Okay, it's not aldosterone dependent, and so they are they are also not very effective diuretics, and they are commonly used with other diuretics, usually for their potassium sparing properties. Okay. So they will prevent the loss of potassium that happens with thiazide and loop diuretics. Okay, so this is similar to the um, the previous drug, the spironolactone. So adverse effects of trimethyrine, increased uric acid, increased urinal stone, and also potassium retention. Okay, so in the next um, presentation, we're going to talk about the carbonic anhydrase inhibitor and subsequently the the osmotic diuretics.